right, my name is Jeff Dallas. And I'm Jacob Farron. And we're the owners of Saracenia Northwest um, Carnivorous Plant Nursery, a nursery that I founded back in 1995. Now, I've been growing carnivorous plants ever since I was a kid, um, but like many of you, had my share of failures growing these kinds of plants. Um, a lot of the information that we had at that time was not very accurate and struggled to um, have the plants survive, but something over time with trial and error that I discovered is these plants are actually much simpler to grow than I first imagined. And since founding the nursery in 1995, we've taught thousands of people how to successfully grow carnivorous plants all over the world. Matter of fact, there's many people from those first years that still have their original plants um, that they purchased from us. One of the secrets that many first-time growers don't realize is that many of the carnivorous plants found in cultivation, like the Venus flytrap, are actually native to the United States. So by studying how these plants grew in the wild, we, we were able to translate that information to successful cultivation. In this instructional video, we're going to teach you how to grow carnivorous plants that are found in the United States. These are some of the most common varieties that you're likely to find for sale. And we're going to share with you some of the very same techniques that we use that have made us successful over the years and to take some of the guesswork out of growing these kinds of plants. Speaking of carnivorous plants, what are we doing in this vegetable garden here? We're here to prove a point. Back here, we have tomato plants, Brussels sprouts, radishes. We even have some, a few potted perennials. And the point is, is that if you can grow these plants, you can grow these. People often ask where carnivorous plants come from, and it turns out that they occur all over the world. There's over 600 species, and there's actually a very diverse group of plants. And you can find them in various places like Southeast Asia, Australia, um, Philippines. They're also found in, in like northern climates like Europe, um, Russia, um, South Africa. But a lot of people are actually very surprised to find out that there is as many as 50 plus different species that actually occur right in the U.S. and Canada. So, which plants are actually are native to the U.S. and Canada? Here on this table, we have a whole selection of different plants that are found in North America. And I'll start down here with some of the ones that, that people may have had some familiarity with and then show you some of the other varieties also. Best place to start is probably right here with the Venus flytrap. Most people have seen these because they've been uh, sold for many, many years as novelties in different kinds of stores across the country. And they're very exciting to people because this is one of the few plants that actually moves fast enough to see. If you want to see Venus flytraps in the wild though, where you'd have to go is down to North and South Carolina. And that's actually the only place in the world that they grow. People often think they're from some steamy rainforest or jungle, but no, it's actually um, from the Carolinas and it's the only place in the world you can actually find those plants. Then these groups of plants that we see right here are different varieties of Saracenia pitcher plant. And they're quite spectacular. Um, probably the one that's most common across North America is this one right here. This is actually called the purple pitcher plant, or Saracenia purpurea, and there's several little subspecies of these also, and they can be found all the way from the Florida panhandle northward into Canada across the eastern seaboard, and it's actually found farther north than any other pitcher plant also. This plant, incidentally, is also the provincial flower of Newfoundland. Now, in the southeastern U.S. is where we find the trumpet pitchers, and that's what a lot of these tall varieties that we see here. Like this one is a plant that's found across um, the Carolinas, Georgia, Florida Panhandle into um, Alabama. It is known as a yellow trumpet. And you can see the bright yellow coloration that it gives off. Absolutely unbelievable bug catcher. Um, and a very magnificent plant produces bright yellow flowers um, in the early spring. In similar habitats, but a little bit farther south, mostly around uh, the Florida Panhandle in Alabama, we have the white top trumpet, or Saracenia leucophila. And this one is brilliantly featured as the white spots and the red color that occurs up in the top of the pitchers on this one. And sometimes these are found used in dried flower arrangements also because of the colorful pitchers that they have on them. Right here in front, we have a plant that's called a sweet pitcher, and there's also several sub-varieties of these, and they get their name because of their sweet-smelling flowers. Um, that they have. This one happens, happens to be called an Alabama sweet pitcher, and as the name implies, it comes from the state of Alabama. Right next to it here is a really short dwelling little plant, and this one is actually called a parrot pitcher, and it gets its name because of its parrot beak little uh, pitchers that it has. It actually has kind of a dual function in that it captures both land dwelling um, insects and aquatic insects um, also. And these can be found also in the Gulf Coast areas of Louisiana, Alabama, Georgia, and around the Florida panhandle. 
Some of the pitcher plant varieties are also fairly rare. This big one back here is referred to as a green pitcher and looks similar to the yellow trumpet, but you can see how much lighter colored it actually is and darker green. And this only occurs in the mountains of Alabama and Georgia and is actually an endangered species. There's very few locations left where this plant still grows. Over here we have our farthest west occurring um, pitcher plant, and this is the um, uh, pale pitcher plant, Saracenia alata. And this one can be found as far west as East Texas, uh, and, but yet it occurs all the way across the Gulf Coast states um, into Alabama um, also. One of the more unusual looking ones is the shorter one here. And these are called hooded pitcher plants, and they get their name because they look like little monk's hoods. And the white spots that you see all over the back of the neck on the hooded pitcher actually allow light inside to make it a little bit easier for an insect to be less fearful to go inside there and to be captured. Now, in addition to the pitcher plants, we also have um, a lot of sticky plants that grow all over North America, and those are the sundews. This kind of odd looking thing is known as a dew thread. And it's a sundew also, although it has a very different appearance. Instead of little flat leaves that hug the ground, it has long sticky leaves. And these are very aggressive little bug catchers and catch all different kinds of insects on those sticky leaves that happen to be up there. My nickname for these is grass with an attitude. Probably the most common one, and this occurs not only in North America, but also in Europe and Asia also. These can be found in, in Russia, as far north as Siberia. These are round leaf sundews. And you can see the glistening drops that are all over these, and the drops are little sticky glue drops that capture tiny insects on their leaves. Also found in more northern climates, Alaska, um, across northern Canada, are the greater English sundew, and this is also found in northern Europe also, also a fairly small plant. And across the southeastern U.S., a pretty common plant in wetlands and bogs, um, is the um, water sundew, sometimes called a love nest sundew also, Drosser intermedia. Now these little green plants that we have ahead of us are butterworts. They're also sticky plants, but rather than having little sticky hairs, the leaf itself mires on little bugs. In the southeast and also in the Carolinas, we have this one, which is known as the blue butterwort, or Pinguiculus cerulea, and is found across the uh, coastline of the Carolinas. Um, this one here is known as a primrose, or a primula flowered butterwort, uh, Pinguicula primula flora. And this one is um, also found across the southeast, mostly in Florida. And then on the west coast, we have butterworts like this one, known as a horn butterwort, found right here in Oregon, also in California, but there are also varieties of them found in Japan and other parts of uh, northern climates. If you want to see what a habitat actually looks like um, for carnivorous plants, you have to visit a bog. So we're going to show you a bog. All right, what we have here in this little pool is actually a pretty close representation of what a bog um, is actually like. Now, what a sphagnum bog actually is, is a, a specific type of wetland, and they occur all over different uh, climates in the northern parts of the world. They're, they occur in any country that's gonna have relatively wet areas um, that happen. But what occurs is this moss that you see growing on top here will be located in areas where there's constant spring water usually trickling through a particular area. Now, over the centuries, um, this moss will begin to grow and pile up and as it partially decomposes, it forms peat moss, which some of you may have used on your lawns before, but this is where peat moss actually comes from, is from these places. Now, bog is often a very abused term because a lot of times in horticulture, if you go to a garden center, you may see different kinds of plants that are labeled as bog plants, but a bog, as you're seeing here, is a very specific kind of place, and those types of plants tend to be more like marsh or swamp type plants. This is an extremely low nutrient, very um, poor environment, and very hard place for most plants to live. And if you're going to be a plant that lives in a bog, most plants here need to be able to get their nutrients from a different place. And the place where they can get that is from little packages called animals. And so these plants capture insects to get that fertilizer that's missing from the soil in this type of environment. Now, because this is such a nutrient deficient environment, it's pretty hostile to other kinds of plants also. And so you're not going to see trees in a bog to speak of, except in maybe occasional little islands here and there that rise up out of it. And because of that, this is also a pretty sunny environment also. And that's also something that the carnivorous plants are quite used to. Now we saw over at the bog that there was a whole variety of different plants over there um, in there and you probably noticed that some of the plants that were in the bog were not actually carnivorous like some of the grasses. So what is it that actually makes um, a plant carnivorous? Well essentially there has to be three things that are going on. 
In order to be able to capture insects for utilizing their nutrients, they have, plant, carnivorous plants have to have specialized leaves that are able in some way to subdue an insect. They also have to have some means for breaking those insects down to be able to get those nutrients, and they actually have to utilize those nutrients and absorb them um, through their leaves. To give you kind of a counter example of some plants that maybe have um, things to protect themselves that would look something like this, the tomato plants that you saw in our garden actually have kind of a sticky surface on the coating of the leaves, but if a bug gets stuck on there, like a little aphid or something, nothing happens to it. It just gets stuck there, and that's pretty much the end of it. It's very different, though, um, with some of these other kinds of plants that have very specialized ways of using using those insects. Let's take a look at one of the first big categories, and that's pitfalls. And that's what all of the Saracenia pitcher plants do. We'll take a look here first over at the purple pitcher plant, because this one employs a little bit different mechanism um, for going about this. Now, it may have dried out a little bit here, but these have an open little well down inside there that actually catches rainwater down inside the little pitcher. And then as an insect begins crawling around the top and they're lured in by nectars the plant produces around that little lip and this little wing right here. And also little hairs that are patterned kind of lead them downward. If they go just a little bit too far, they will slip and fall, tumble into the water and drown. This plant does have some enzymes that it puts into the water to help break them down. They also rely very heavily on bacteria and also some symbiotic insects such as a mosquito larva um, that lives in the um, pitcher plant leaves and actually reproduces no place else. Fortunately, this particular mosquito is one that doesn't uh, feed on blood or bite people. Now its cousins, the trumpet pitchers, are a little bit different. We'll take a look at our green pitcher plant here for a moment because it has nice big leaves on it. What's going on here is there's a nectar secretion up here along the top of the lid. If the light hits it just right, you can kind of see it. It's kind of a shine that's on there. It's very sugary, it's very sweet, and look, there's a little bug right there that just landed on there to get himself a little bit of something to eat. Now, if an insect walks a little bit too far down inside looking for more of that nectar, they encounter an extremely waxy zone. As a matter of fact, on this leaf right here in the front, you can actually see the color change kind of occur on there. And if you were to look at that under a microscope, what you're gonna see are a whole bunch of little tiny uh, microscopic teeth that point downward and insects cannot hang onto that once they get their little foot pads on it. So if they go a little bit too far, they tumble, they fall. Bottom of the tube has all these little downward pointing hairs that won't let them back out inside there. And the plant then secretes digestive enzymes from the insides of the tube to go ahead and to break them down. Now, let's go ahead and see what it actually looks like on the inside of one of these. We have an old leaf that's kind of on its way out here on the green pitcher. And we'll go ahead and open it up here so you can see if it's actually caught anything or not. see some things here already. I'll just take it to right there. Let's go ahead and open her up. Oh my goodness. And there you can see that little fine mesh of hairs down inside there. Looks like we've caught yellow jackets, flies, box elder bugs. You can see some of the wetness from the enzymes. There's a little bit of a bee there. You can see how they're all kind of packed down inside that tube. Not a particularly pretty sight. Now, another big category, and actually all of the um, trumpet pitchers use an extremely similar method um, for capturing bugs. And so then those nutrients are utilized. Um, they store those for fertilizer down in their rhizome, and then a whole new set of leaves will come up next spring after they go ahead and fill up with um, the insects. But another way to capture bugs is actually to um, be sticky, to be kind of a living flypaper. And that's what the sundews are all about. And so here's those glistening droplets again that we saw earlier um, on here. And you can probably see all along the dewthreads leaves right here, there's little tiny insects stuck all over them. Now if a bug lands on this and they can't get themselves off of there, the little hairs are going to begin to bend and wrap right to where the insect is at. And they start secreting digestive enzymes to dissolve the insect and absorb those nutrients um, into their leaf. And again, they're using those nutrients for fertilizer. Here on the round leaf sundew, you can actually see a small insect right here on this leaf and how the leaf is actually beginning to fold over um, onto that bug um, that it caught on there. And sometimes the leaf will fold over just like a little catcher's mitt and, and wrap it all around. And what that does is it helps to keep fluids from being washed off um, during rain. So that's another little adaptation this one has. And the other sundews work very similar. Now the butterworts are also sticky plants, but they're just a touch different. Now here on this little horn butterwort, you look very carefully, it's very tiny, but you can see an indentation right there on the leaf, and there's kind of a shine on the leaves. As a matter of fact, the butterwort's scientific name, pinguicula, means little greasy ones. So little tiny insects, like gnats, 
get stuck to these, then they have little flat digestive glands right on the leaf that break those insects down and absorb them right into the leaf surface. And probably the most dramatic by far of these capturing mechanisms are the Venus flytrap, just kind of like a steel jaw trap that's on here. Now, strangely enough, Venus flytraps are actually related to sundews, um, but they have a much more sophisticated trap. Now, what goes on with these is you can, the light catches it just right, you can see little tiny hairs on the inside of the trap. They're in like a little triangle pattern. So like there's one there, there's one there, and there's one right there. If an insect walks across that trap and touches one, nothing happens. But if they touch two of them or another one, uh, the same trigger hair twice, rapidly, then that happens. Now this one closed rather slow. I'm guessing it's because it was a fairly new trap that hadn't really fully developed yet. If we look at one of these older traps over here, I'm do this one right here. We'll touch its trigger hairs. Boom, and they slam shut just like that. Now once the trap closes, if it was accidentally triggered by like a piece of grass or um, a pebble or something like that, or just like me touching it, that trap will now reset in about 24 hours, but it has to grow new cells inside to be able to do that. So if you're growing Venus fly traps, not a good idea to do that on a regular basis. However, if a bug is inside there, then the trap will close and it will seal off. And five to 10 days later, after it finishes digestion, it'll go ahead and reopen. And you can probably see here all of these exoskeletons of flies and various other insects that have been captured by the Venus flytrap. If a trap looks like this, where you can see that crease that's inside there, that one actually has an insect inside there that it's working on right now. Now, as we went through all the different methods that carnivorous plants capture insects, and you saw all the carnage of the bugs that were stuck to them or fell down inside the pitchers, uh, a very, very frequent question that we get asked all the time is, do I have to feed them? What if I don't have enough bugs at my place? Well, the first thing that I'll say is, is that all the insects that you saw these plants capture, they captured on their own. We didn't give those bugs to any of them. Bugs are fertilizer for carnivorous, carnivorous plants. They're not energy, which is very different than the reason that like animals eat, and they definitely capture their own. The other thing is, is that carnivorous plants are not animals. Um, they're definitely plants, and they do almost everything that normal plants do. They're simply getting their fertilizer in a different place than other kinds of plants are. So the bottom line, do you need to feed your plants? The answer is no. So what does it take to be successful in growing carnivorous plants? As Jeff said, carnivorous plants are plants, not animals. And as plants, carnivorous plants need three important ingredients, sunlight, water, and soil. When you can provide those three ingredients, sunlight, water, and soil, in the proper levels, you will be successful in growing carnivorous plants. So let's start with sunlight. As Jeff said, Bugs are not a source of energy for carnivorous plants. They're actually a source of fertilizer. Plants, and carnivorous plants especially, get their energy from sunlight. How much sunlight does a carnivorous plant need? Actually, they need a lot more than you actually think. And the reason for that is because it's odd leaf shape. This particular carnivorous plant has a tubular leaf shape, and as such, it's not very efficient in capturing sunlight. Only half of it is capturing sunlight. And so it's not a very efficient form for photosynthesis. That's the process of making sugar, which is the plant's form of energy. Even the Venus flytrap needs a lot more sunlight than you actually think. When you look at this plant, its leaf has many different angles on it. And so that's not very efficient in capturing sunlight. Part of it is gonna be out of the sun at certain angles, and part of it is gonna be in sun. Another factor affecting how much light these plants actually need is the number of leaves they have. 
this particular flytrap has only one, two, three, four, five, six leaves. And remember, the traps are leaves, and so are the pitchers on the pitcher plant. They're not flowers, they're leaves. This particular pitcher plant has only three leaves on it. And because of the scarcity of leaves and the odd shape of their leaves, they really do need a lot of sunlight. And when we talk about a lot of sunlight, we're really talking about full sun. And full sun is actually six hours or more of direct sunlight. Now, another reason why carnivorous plants need a lot more sunlight than you actually think, it's not so obvious. Carnivorous plants have to take an extra step in producing nectar and enzymes to both digest and attract insects. This sundew is covered with dew and in order to produce all the nectar and enzymes that cover the leaves of this sundew, it needs a tremendous amount of energy and it gets that energy from sunlight. So without sunlight, the sundew won't do dew. Very often in growing carnivorous plants, one of the issues that can be a bit problematic for people can be water uh, because carnivorous plants are so used to being in areas where there's almost no minerals in the water whatsoever that if they're exposed to water that has a high mineral content, um, it can often be a real problem. Now, depending on where you live, um, you definitely can use tap water if the mineral content is low enough. Some public supplies, such as Portland, Oregon, and several others, do have a very low mineral water um, that's perfectly safe to use for carnivorous plants. At other places, though, such as here out here at our nursery, our well water has a very high calcium and magnesium content, and that actually makes it really hard on carnivorous plants as it builds up in their trays and in the soil over time. And so our water actually has to be purified. Now, the way that you can find out whether or not your water is going to be suitable or not is by having it tested. Now they do make um, small test kits that can be used for that. As a matter of fact, I was at a um, large garden center that happened to have pond supplies and this were some little test strips that I found that not only measured hardness but also pH and also things like nitrates and nitrites also since this was also um, for finding out water quality for fish. You can also contact your, if you're in a city, on your water bureau because they have to do a yearly EPA a report that also has hardness as part of that or the dissolved solids inside the, um, the water. They do make various small um, hand testers that can be used to find out the total dissolved solids of minerals in the water. Let's take a look at one that we have here and some samples of water we have. One of the issues you're trying to find out about your water is the overall mineral content of that water, how hard it is, um, or the total dissolved solids. A little meter that you see up here is a device that can do just that, and it'll tell you that in a measurement known as parts per million. And what we're trying to find out is if your water is gonna be appropriate for carnivorous plants or not. Generally speaking, if the total dissolved solids are 50 parts per million or below, then your water is gonna be okay uh, for watering carnivorous plants with. Now, when we first moved out here to Eagle Creek, um, we're on a well here at our place, and most wells have a significant amount of mineral dissolved in the water. Now, although that's not harmful for people, it's actually somewhat beneficial, it's not gonna be uh, beneficial for our plants out here. So let's go ahead and use our little meter and find out uh, what our well water measures at. And it looks like we're up around 129 parts per million here on our well water, and that's definitely above the safety zone, because uh, this will begin to build up as the water evaporates out of trays and out of pots. All right, let's go ahead and see what our uh, water is after we pass it through our reverse osmosis unit now. We'll go ahead and trade it off here. Okay, we'll let it sit for a second there. I'm gonna turn it so I can see what it's doing. And right now, it's showing us about 12 to 13 parts per million on here, well within the safe zone um, to go ahead and to use on carnivorous plants. Now, let's suppose that you're in an area where the mineral content of the water is very high, like it might be in the desert southwest, and you're gonna be using maybe some bottled water. Let's show you what distilled water is like. All righty, and here's our distilled water. Take a look so I can see it. And the meter's remaining at zero. Distilled water has absolutely nothing else in it, so this is gonna be safe for any um, kind of carnivorous plants um, that you happen to wanna grow.
once you find out what the quality is, you can decide whether or not it's going to be safe to use your tap water um, or if you're going to have to go ahead and use some other source. Now some of those other sources um, can be different kinds of bottled water and the most basic and simple to use is distilled water. Now that's what I have right here in this and distilled water is made by steam distillation which means that they boil the water and then the steam is recondensed back into uh, water again and that leaves all the minerals behind. This is 100% safe to use. The only drawback that it probably has is that it's fine if you have one or two plants but if you have a larger collection this can get a little bit expensive. Another good source of water if your water has too many minerals is rainwater. Now you can definitely um, collect rainwater by setting pans outside and, and collecting rain if you're in a higher rainfall area. One good thunderstorm would probably give you plenty of rainwater if you're in the eastern part of the U.S. Um, it's also Sometimes people have rain barrels where they collect off the top of their roofs of a, of a house. Be cautious about this though because many roofs are treated with chemicals or with uh, zinc metal to inhibit moss growth and that can be a bit harmful um, to carnivorous plants. Now some waters you need to avoid of bottled waters though would include um, bottled spring water like this one because these can be from any number of sources. Some of them are low mineral but many of them are very high mineral because often for people to drink um, that extra little bit of uh, taste that comes from minerals is actually desirable. Now if you find out that you do have um, hard water or high mineral water, um, some of the first things that will come to mind for folks is, is filtration for that and many people on their houses if they live in a hard water area do have water softeners. Softeners though um, don't help when it comes to growing carnivorous plants because what they do is they exchange the calcium and magnesium that might be in that water with um, salt or sodium and that actually makes the water just as bad for the plants um, as it would be if you'd left it just the way that it was. So softeners don't work for this case. Many people also have carbon filters like our Breda that we have here and there's other brands of these too and these are pretty good at removing chlorine um, which can be a problem sometimes it often is not um, but again these types of filters don't remove the minerals that are most harmful um, to carnivorous plants. The type of filter that it takes to do that is what we have down inside our little cabinet right here. You can see off here um, to this side. Um, this is a reverse osmosis unit and what this uh, filter does is it actually forces water through some membranes that um, have little tiny holes in them only big enough for water molecules to pass through um, but not the mineral molecules. So the reverse osmosis unit will definitely um, take care of um, the water but they tend to be a bit more expensive also. Now chlorine can sometimes be an issue um, in water and it just depends on your uh, public supply whether it will or not. Now one example, when we used to live in Portland, Oregon, not too far from here, they did chlorinate the water there but they used chlorine gas to uh, chlorinate it and that would dissipate from the water quickly just if it sat. So you could actually just um, dispense buckets of water and let them sit for 24 hours. Some other public supplies use different kinds of chlorinators that may not dissipate very quickly um, or at all and so what you may need to do is to test that water on some other types of plants that are maybe a little more resistant such as garden plants and if you're not seeing any um, harmful effects there um, then go ahead and test it on you know a, a small um, inexpensive carnivorous plant or two um, to find out if it's going to be a problem or not for your plants. Um, if it is a carbon filter like the Brita we were showing is a good way to get rid of the chlorine. All right, very often when it comes to transplanting carnivorous plants, people are a little mystified by the soil that needs to be used or there's a confusion of what's okay and what's not okay to use. Now what we um, use is essentially what you're going to find carnivorous plants growing in the wild in, and that's peat moss. And so peat moss is essentially the soil media um, and that's sold at most garden centers in bales like you see here. And I, if you, when you purchase peat moss, I strongly recommend that you do get it in a bale size rather than a small sack like some of these other ingredients are in because this is going to be nothing but compressed um, peat moss and nothing else. Sometimes in small bags, the peat moss will have traces of fertilizer from other ingredients that have been mixed in the, in the manufacturer, um, or some companies intentionally add the fertilizer because it's beneficial to other kinds of plants, um, but is not going to be beneficial at all um, to carnivorous plants. Mixing the soil is a very straightforward uh, purpose, but let me introduce you to some of the other ingredients that can be really helpful in a soil mix. Even though peat is the base mix, because we're talking about potted plants, it's good to have some extra drainage in there. And the ingredient we use most often for drainage is this white stuff that you see here um, called perlite. And this is also available in small bags a lot of times like this also. Or sometimes if you're going to be using a lot of it, you can buy it in large sacks because it can also be used to make other kinds of uh, soil ingredients for regular plants also. But essentially perlite is just a, a white rocky substance that's going to add a lot of air and increase the drainage um, in um, the media. Now, some places perlite if it's difficult to find. Um, volcanic pumice is also perfectly okay to use. And also washed sand 
is a, is a perfectly good soil ingredient also to add um, drainage to uh, the peat moss just to get that water going through there and to provide more air spaces for it. But mixing it is actually no more complicated than this. What you're gonna do with your peat moss is open a bag up, and this is usually compressed dry, and I usually just use a pot to go ahead and scoop up um, a quantity of it, and we're gonna mix this in equal amounts. So if I do like maybe two scoops of our peat moss, put it in there, and you may find some little chunks that are in there and just kind of break those up a little bit. Then go ahead and add your dry perlite. Now, one little caution about perlite, this stuff is very dusty and it's made out of mostly silica and you're probably not gonna to wanna to be breathing those vapors. So either wear a dust mask or wet it down first uh, to get it good and damp and then the dust won't be an issue whatsoever um, for doing this. Of course, I'm being a bad example, not wearing my dust mask while doing this, but this is a very small quantity. Now, once you've got them in here um, together, go ahead and mix them up dry a little bit. And this stuff is actually cleaner to mix than regular soil is, but if you don't like getting peat moss on your fingernails, feel free to wear a pair of gloves when you do this. It won't hurt you in any way. And then just begin adding water um, to your mix. Now this is a little bit of guesstimation when you do this. I usually put some in just the very beginning until there's some in there. And you have to work the peat moss a little bit at first to get it to absorb water. Okay, so mine's grabbing some right away. Keep adding a little bit more. And as you might expect, definitely use um, you know, mineral-free water to do this with, because that's gonna be locked up right in that peat moss right away. And I just work the stuff like cookie dough until it begins to absorb the water. See, we still have some dry spots in there. Okay, this is getting pretty good. Now, if your soil is about where you want it to be, usually you can just grab handful it, squeeze it, and if water comes out like that, you've gotten your peat moss to absorb the water, and it's pretty much good to go. Sometimes it's not a bad idea to uh, let it sit for a little bit um, before you get ready to use it uh, for transplanting. Okay, that's pretty much good to go. Now in some areas of the country, um, peat moss can be a little bit hard to find either because they just don't use it uh, in certain areas or it's just harder to uh, get to certain locales. Um, long fiber sphagnum moss um, can also be used, especially for Saracenia pitcher plants. This ingredient's a little bit more expensive, but sometimes it's more available. And this is usually found in garden centers where they sell orchid products or uh, things for repotting orchids, as you can find the sphagnum. Similar treatment, you don't necessarily need to add perlite to this, just make sure it's really um, saturated with water before you use it. Um, avoid using sphagnum moss for Venus flytraps. Um, it tends to be a little bit too um, uh, dense on them um, in there. Um, it can be okay for some sundews and others um, may not. You may need to consult a book to find out uh, what specific species um, are gonna be okay with this and which ones are not. But the peat perlite mix is, is almost a universal um, carnivorous plant mix for North American species. Now, here's a couple things to avoid um, when it comes to repotting. Cannot tell you the number of times in our nursery we've gotten calls from people and they're like, I went to repot my Venus flytrap from my pitcher plant and I put it in potting soil. Was that okay? The answer to that is no. Regular potting soil, like we have here, is absolutely wonderful for some of our garden plants that we have back there. But because there's fertilizer and other ingredients in this, this will become toxic to carnivorous plants very fast. Don't use this. Make sure you either mix your own or get um, some premixed soil from a reputable carnivorous plant dealer. One other ingredient, there's a lot of concern um, about um, peat harvesting in the wild um, because this does get mined um, from bogs up in Canada and uh, some companies are more um, uh, ecologically minded about how they harvest it than others are. And so there's a bit of a debate about this right now and a substitute that comes out periodically is this stuff right here known as core or it's coconut fiber. Now, in some applications, this stuff can be a good substitute for peat moss, but we've tried it on several occasions and in several applications, and we just don't really think that it's suitable for growing um, carnivorous plants because it can have a bit of a high salt content, and it also tends to break down a lot faster um, than peat moss does also. So this is one place where this particular substitute is probably not gonna be a good substitute um, for peat. Um, however, this might be um, not bad in potting mixes that are made for other types of plants. Just don't use it on carnivorous plants and that's soil. Sunlight is one of the most important aspects about growing carnivorous plants. What you need to remember is that sunlight is required for sugar or energy production, 
plants do not get energy from bugs. Most carnivorous plants need full sun because of their unusual leaf shape, because they have very few leaves, and because they have to secrete enzymes to digest insects. When we refer to full sun, we mean six or more hours of direct sunlight, the same type of lighting you would need to grow tomato plants, vegetables, and roses. Carnivorous plants need water that is pure or very low in minerals. In many instances, tap water is perfectly okay if it's low in minerals. Ideally, water should be less than 50 parts per million in dissolved minerals. So before using your tap water, check for its water hardness. You can purchase a test kit from an aquarium supply store, or you can call your local water bureau for this information. If your tap water is very high in minerals, you need to use bottled distilled water, rainwater, or water filtered through a reverse osmosis unit. What you need to avoid using is bottled spring water because it can be very high in minerals. Also avoid rainwater collected from roofs treated with mineral-based fungicides. Also avoid water passed through a water softener because of the added sodium. The best type of water filter for the home is a reverse osmosis unit. It's capable of removing all types of minerals, chlorine, and organic matter. Carbon filters are excellent at removing chlorine, heavy metals, and organic matter, but they do not remove calcium, magnesium, or iron. Most North American carnivorous plants are very tolerant of chlorine, so it's not always necessary to remove it from the water before using it with your plants. For instance, chlorine gas dissipates very quickly, so water chlorinated with chlorine gas is acceptable. If your water is chlorinated with chloramines, then you'll need to use a reverse osmosis unit or a carbon filter to remove them. Chloramines last much longer and will not dissipate even when you allow the water to sit for a day. If you're not sure how your water is chlorinated, contact your local water bureau. Carnivorous plants need soil that is acidic and very low in nutrients. The standard soil mix for carnivorous plants is one part sphagnum peat moss and one part perlite. You may also substitute perlite with pumice, washed sand, or silica sand. Always avoid using potting soil, garden soil, compost, and fertilizer. These types of soil and soil ingredients will kill your carnivorous plants. As tempting as it may be, also avoid using ground coconut husk, also known as cocoa peat. While it may be fine to use it with regular plants, it's not an acceptable soil ingredient for carnivorous plants. Earlier we took you on sort of a brief tour of the American pitcher plants and some of the other North American carnivorous plants and here you can see our collection at Saracenia Northwest um, that we have out here and in addition to the species that we showed you all of the colors that you see on the sides and behind you are the myriad of different hybrids of pitcher plants that are out there some that have absolutely stunning colors many of the hybrids are the ones that you're likely to see within the nursery trade um, that are available for sale but care of these plants is all exactly the same and basically what you're looking at for caring for a pitcher plant is a lot of what you see around us right now. It's really no more complicated than making sure um, that you have them in the proper soil, and that's, that's our peat moss perlite mix um, that we have, and that they're in a full sun location, just like you see these plants. And as a rule of thumb, we generally say that if uh, wherever you're thinking about putting a pitcher plant, you should be able to grow a tomato plant in that spot. If it's not bright enough for a tomato, it wouldn't be bright enough for a pitcher plant either. And then finally, the plants need to be sitting in a um, small, shallow tray of water of some kind. You can see many of our water trays here behind us. A lot of our smaller plants are in. These pools all have about two inches of water. You can use pretty much any kind of container that will hold water to provide a water tray um, for your plant. As I was describing before, it needs to be low mineral water also. Now, if you're not really excited about standard horticultural trays for using for water trays, there's some other options that are really quite effective. For instance, Sometimes they make decorative pots that are sealed in the bottom and where you can set a plastic pot 
down inside and then fill this reservoir up with water and but you don't want it any deeper than you normally see they are out here so still only about a quarter of the way up the pot. Um, avoid putting any kind of covering on this because you need to be able to see the water down inside um, so you know when to go ahead and add um, water to it but this is a way to have a little bit more decorative water reservoir um, for your plants. Then um, they just go ahead and, and find your spot for them where they're going to be in the sun, keep them watered. And then um, if you live in um, zone seven or eight, um, USDA zones, they're definitely going to stay outside um, the entire year. The infamous Venus flytrap, the most commonly grown carnivorous plant in the world. The care for it is very similar as to the Saracenia pitcher plants that Jeff showed you earlier. Basically, the soil consists of one part peat moss and one part perlite, the standard soil mix that Jeff showed you earlier. And you want to set this plant in full sun. And that's right, in full sun, six or more hours of direct sunlight. And you also want to set it in a dish of water, no more than halfway up the pot. Now I want to show you some of the different types of Venus flytraps that actually exist. This is the typical Venus flytrap that you might get in the store. And it's commonly sold in this three inch pot in this size because it's a lot easier to ship this way. People often ask when they see this plant, how big do Venus flytraps get? Well, here's a much older version of that same flytrap. You can see that it's not exactly the size of Audrey II but it is uh, considerably larger than this younger variety. This one is about two to three years old. This is probably at least five years old. One striking variety that you might also find is called the red dragon. And it's noted for its complete red colors throughout the plant. And it develops this red color when it's grown in full sun. Something along that line to the red dragon is the red piranha. Now this is different from the red dragon. I'll hold this red dragon up for comparison. And when you see the teeth on both of these plants, the red piranha has short triangular teeth, whereas the red dragon has slightly longer teeth. Something similar to the red piranha is the dente. And this is a very common variety as well that you might find uh, either through online nurseries or at a grocery store perhaps. And like the red piranha, it has very short triangular teeth. Another variety of the Venus flytrap is this one here, and it's called an all green variety. Just as the red dragon is an all red variety, this variety has no red in it. It's completely green, even when grown in full sun. Another variety, is the sawtooth. And this one is really interesting because its teeth are just jagged, just like on a sawtooth. And right here, I have a digital thermometer and hygrometer. You can make your own decisions about what Venus flytraps need in regards to relative humidity. These are the North American sundews that Jeff mentioned earlier. I'm just going to touch briefly on how to care for them because their care is essentially the same as the Saracenia pitcher plants and the Venus flytraps. The soil to use is one part peat moss and one part perlite. And after that, you want to set the plant in full sun and in some standing water, no more than halfway up the pot. Other than that, you're good to go. Now butterworts we had talked about a little bit earlier when we were introducing the North American carnivorous plants and their care is going to be very similar um, to the pitcher plants only the difference with these is butterworts do tend to grow low to the ground with grasses net among them in nature and so they're definitely ones that will benefit from having a little bit of shading around them so it, if you have other um, carnivorous plants like pitcher plants you can often use those as a little bit of a, a shade element for the butterworts that tends to make them very happy. Their soil mix is identical so the peat perlite works just fine uh, for the North American variety. Um, for these and so again uh, just make sure that you've, you've got them in the right kind of soil a little bit of extra shade um, for butterworts not full shade though they just need a little bit of a shade from intense sunlight um, and make sure you're keeping them wet just like the pitcher plants one question we commonly get from growers is 
Can I grow these plants together in the same pot? The answer is yes. Because these plants essentially have the same growing requirements, they will easily grow well together in a large pot such as this converted bathtub. This collection contains pitcher plants, fly traps, sundews, and butterworts. Because the tub is very large, we chose to water the tub frequently rather than setting it in water. Another question we get is, can I still grow pitcher plants, fly traps, and sundews inside my home? Because many of these plants require full sun, six or more hours of direct sunlight, most homes don't have the necessary lighting to keep these plants happy. Our rule of thumb is this. If you can successfully grow a tomato plant where you want to grow your carnivorous plants, then you have the right type of sunlight. Otherwise, grow your plants outside. Here is a photograph of two pitcher plants of the same variety and age. It's a Judith Hindel hybrid. The plant on the left was grown outdoors in full sun. The plant on the right was grown for a few months in a sunny west window in a home. If you want to grow carnivorous plants in your home, consider growing tropical carnivorous plants. We'll cover these plants in volumes two and three. If you want to learn more about carnivorous plants, definitely visit our website, cobraplant.com. There are also many books out there, Carnivorous Plants by Adrian Slack and Carnivorous Plants of the United States and Canada by Donald Schnell. After watching our video, you can see that if you can grow plants like our garden plants behind us, you can most certainly grow um, these carnivorous plants also. Now, in addition to these that you've seen that are U.S. natives and are strictly outdoor plants, there's also a fair number, actually quite a large number, of tropical carnivorous plants which can be suitable for growing indoors also, uh, which we hope to cover in a future video. Thanks for watching.